Donald Trump talks Mar-a-Lago, and he is also responding to some of the allegations that he declassified these documents. He is talking to Sean Hannity, and Sean Hannity asks him, did you go through a process? But there's more because Donald Trump also is the recipient of sort of a bad ruling by the status quo thinking that came down from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. And before we get into this motion, remember that the government does not want the special master that was previously appointed to look at the documents. That's why they appealed this thing. And we read through their memo and Trump's memo, and we've unpacked this in prior shows. But the argument was the criminal prosecution needed to stop and the delivery of the 100 documents needed to stop. That was the original order that came out from Judge Eileen Cannon, the district level judge. That judge was challenged by the prosecutors who said to the Court of Appeals, that should be stayed. Don't allow the judge to do those things. Please stay it. Trump said, no, we want the special master to do those things. But the 11th Circuit came out and said, no. They granted the government's appeal as to both counts. And I want to show you now the actual documents. 29 page order out of the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals in the case of Donald Trump versus the United States of America. And this is on appeal from the Southern District of Florida, the lower level court where Judge Eileen Canton granted the stay, granted the order appointing the special master and the government didn't want that to happen. They said, please undo that stay or, or grant a stay and undo the special master order. So when they took it up to the Court of Appeals, we have three circuit judges who write as follows per curiam, meaning this is the opinion of the court. This is not just one judge who's signing off on this document. This is all of us sort of signing together. They write following the execution of a search warrant at Trump's house, Trump moved for a special master to be appointed. And the district court, Judge Eileen Cannon, granted that in substantial part. Now, the United States government is here asking for a stay of Cannon's order as it relates to those 100 documents. The Court of Appeal says we decide only, only, right? We're limiting this. And we talked about this yesterday about the scope. Can the Court of Appeals just kind of go out there and do this, that, or the other? And they can, but here, right, they don't. They say we decide only the narrow question presented. One, whether the United States the government has established that it is entitled to a stay of the order, right? That's it. Is it entitled to a stay? And if it is, to the extent that it requires the government to submit to the special master those 100 documents, okay? Do, do they have to give those over? And number two, does it enjoin the United States from using those subsets in a criminal investigation? And they say, we conclude it has. The government has met their burden. The government is saying, we, we are going to be irreparably harmed and all of the different indicia that we talked about previously, the Court of Appeals is agreeing. Now they write, we stress the limited nature of our review. Okay, very limited. They say this matter comes to us on a motion for a partial stay pending the appeal. We cannot and do not decide the merits of the case. Right? Not about whether Trump is a criminal or a nuclear thief or whatever. They're just saying, look, only on the partial stay pending appeal. We decide only the traditional equitable considerations, including whether the United States has shown a substantial likelihood of prevailing on the merits, the harm each party must suffer, and where the public interest lies, right? Those are the same factors that we've covered a lot here previously. And they say, for the reasons we explained below, we grant the U.S. motion for a partial stay pending the appeal. Judge Eileen Cannon, of course, is going to get this order, and we'll take a look at see, and see how she responded to it. But before we do, let's get into the order. 11th Circuit writes, we've got some factual background. They say that the Trump presidency ended and he left in January 2021. When he left, there were boxes of documents that were transferred from the White House to his personal residence in Florida. The record reveals that throughout 2021 and consistent with its responsibilities under the PRA, the Presidential Records Act, NARA sought to get those records from Trump. In response to those requests, Trump, in January, gave them 15 boxes of documents. They sent them back over. National Archives reviewed the documents and said that there were newspapers in there, magazine articles, and also presidential correspondence, and also post-presidential records, and a lot of classified records, right? That is in an affidavit that they submitted to go search his residence. So after they found that, they said, uh-oh, there's classified records in there. And, and those were the overdue library books. And NARA 
Deborah Steidel Wall said that we got to get those library books back. And because Joe Biden waived that executive privilege that authorized the DOJ to sort of get the referral from NARA, send the FBI in to go take care of business. They write, consequently, the National Archives sent a referral by email to the DOJ, right? And that is the referral. That's the, that's the start of this whole thing because the National Archives had that executive privilege waived by the Biden people. The 11th Circuit says, upon learning about the classified materials, the department sought access to the 15 boxes so the FBI and the intelligence agencies, so-called, could examine them. National Archives told Trump that it was going to give F FBI access to the, uh, during the week of April 18th. Trump requested an extension and the National Archives held off on sending the documents to the FBI. On that date, Trump asked for another extension of time and said if the National Archives declined to grant the extension, that guess what? Trump is going to assert executive privilege over the documents. So I'm entitled to the documents. Uh, we're willing to work with you. But if you're not going to give us additional time, we're just going to assert executive privilege over them. And you're not entitled to them anyways. That's our legal interpretation of the statutes. On May 10th, the National Archives informed Trump's lawyers that it had decided not to honor Trump's protective claim. Why? Because the former president, the current president waived all of that, right? He said, no, 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 We're not going to allow that to happen. I want those documents. I want Trump rated. And so he waived all of that. And so Trump's representatives, they, they say, we're asserting it. But NARA said, we don't care. We're not honoring that. And we are going to give F the FBI access to the records in May. The letter noted that President Biden had deferred to the National Archives that the executive privilege did not apply, right? And so Biden, as we, we've covered this previously, but Biden sort of affirmatively, according to Judge Eileen Cannon, made, made the affirmative acknowledgement at the urging of the current president that the executive privilege was waived, which allowed the National Archives to go instigate all this. Despite this advanced warning, Trump made no effort to block the FBI's access to the documents at that time. So the 11th Circuit says, during a preliminary review of the documents between certain dates, the FBI found that 184 documents included various classification level markings. FBI also developed evidence in other boxes. The department obtained a grand jury subpoena directed to the plaintiff's custodian of records, which I think is Lindsey Halligan, who was one of Trump's lawyers, and requested all documents and writings be verified that they were turned over. Counsel was served with that subpoena on May, and I'm pretty sure she signed off on it. Right. So that's the document that it says, uh, did you give us all the library books back? We're here to get the library books. OK, we did like a rough search of the place. Did we get them all? And you say you got them all. And they say, can uh, can you just sign this document to make sure that we really got them all? And she did. You got them all. Get out of here. The 11th Circuit says that Trump sought and received an extension of time to produce the subpoena documents. After initially denying the request, the government extended the compliance deadline. In response to the subpoena, Trump's representatives produced an envelope containing 38 documents, and they certified that a diligent search was conducted and any and all responsive documents had been turned over. Envelope co contained classified documents and other things. Plaintiff made no claims of privilege with his production in, in, in response to that subpoena. Right. And so this this custodian of records, this Lindsay Halligan or whoever. Right. There's going to be some issues with that. But, you know, who conducted that search and does that connect Trump to any liability? Because it sounds like, right, he delegated all of this to his custodian of records who signed off on a document. And right, it's, it's pretty important you don't just sign documents if you don't know what, what you're signing, obviously. So if a diligent search was not conducted and she signed that it was, well, that's not ideal, right? And it could have led to this. But does that translate over to Trump's criminal liability? Right? I mean, he's got to have more, in, more intent than that, doesn't he? We'll see. Despite Trump's production in response to the subpoena and Trump lawyers representation that a diligent search had occurred and all responsive documents had been produced, the FBI developed evidence. Oh, yeah. Remember with the um, undercover mole at Mar-a-Lago who is rummaging around there, you know, sort of uh, surreptitiously spying on everything. They found that more classified documents were at Trump's residence. And so in August, the department through the FBI's agent's sworn affidavit, informed Judge Reinhardt, the magistrate judge, that we got evidence. And the judge agreed, said, yeah, there's probable cause. Certainly go raid the president's. And he did that all over the WhatsApp, remember? The WhatsApp. He's like, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of uh, indisposed at the moment. Can you just WhatsApp me? Yeah. Trump? Oh, I hate him. 
oh, that's right. I had a conflict of interest with him on the Hillary versus Trump versus Hillary case. And I got off that case. But uh, if you want to raid his residence, no problem. I'll just WhatsApp the whole thing. No problem. Go do it. So they did. And the FBI concocted this, this affidavit that we still have not seen yet. And they went and raided his residence before they spread the photos all over the ground and sort of manipulated the evidence and then published that image in front of uh, the entire world. Now, they say that there was enough there that Trump was committing crimes. All right. And based on this evidence, the magistrate judge issued a search warrant for Trump's residence. When the FBI executed the search warrant, it seized 33 items, mostly boxes of documents, containing 11,000 documents and other items in the most general search warrant you've ever seen that said they had access to everything. Among the boxes, 13 contained documents with classification markings. All told, the search undercover uncovered over 100 documents marked confidential, secret, or top secret. So again, right, a very small percentage of this, 100 documents out of the 11,000 documents and out of the 1,200 12,800 total items, only 100 documents in that category. And so who conducted the diligent search? Did they look through all the boxes? I mean, it's, you know, out of 11,000 documents, you could easily miss 100. Is that criminal? Is that something that warrants criminal culpability for Donald Trump specifically? They want it too. Yes, they want to say yes. And as we talked about yesterday, part of the Trump dilemma that he runs into is if he says, if I declassified everything and he affirmatively acknowledges that he declassified every single document, I, yep, every one of them, I know everything that's in there. Well, what if one of those documents maybe should not have been declassified? You're sort of taking ownership over the whole thing. And in terms of criminal liability, you don't want that. You want that spread around as much as possible. Many other co-defendants, custodian of records, there's the moving company. I don't know. Who, call U-Haul. I don't know who moved the boxes, right? They're responsible for that, not me. In accordance with the protocol that the magistrate judge had approved the search warrant, the department, the DOJ, directed the, quote, privilege review team composed of agents not otherwise participating in the investigation, right, to review certain seized documents for attorney-client privilege, right? So the FBI said, we're going to have a separate team and it is going to only review the attorney-client privilege stuff so that we can sort of separate that out because, of course, that's privilege. Based on its review, the privilege team identified and segregated, they say, an initial subset of about 520 pages, not documents, that might contain privileged materials. With the remaining documents, members of the investigative team found two instances, at least, of potentially privileged materials, which they delivered to the privilege review team. Do you see that? That this me we've got two teams now we got to keep track of the investigative team and the privilege review team court of appeals is acknowledging that the investigation team which is not supposed to see pr privileged material obviously that's why you have a privilege review team there were at least two instances which is what eileen cannon pointed to and said hey doj you said you're doing a great job here managing all these documents and being very forthcoming with the opposing counsel but uh, apparently you're not because we've got two situations where you had privileged materials that you're not supposed to have. And so how about we don't give you the benefit of the doubt? So the Court of Appeals is acknowledging, right, that that has in fact happened. They go through the procedural history. Appeals are usually you know, some heavy, heavy lifting in terms of the legalese, but this looks pretty reasonable here. Procedural history, they say two weeks after the execution of the search warrant, Trump filed a motion asking for a special master, and we all covered that at length. They talk about jurisdiction and equitable jurisdiction. And remember, the government said that the court, Eileen Cannon, at the district level, had no authority to appoint a special master or to craft equitable remedies, and meaning injunctions, meaning stopping or starting something. And one of the injunctions here was to stop the prosecution from moving forward on their criminal investigation of Trump. And so this is what they're talking about. They say the United States made three arguments in opposition they say the United States said that there was a lack of standing there and that the special master was an exception to the rule, not the rule, and that even if he could, privilege would yield to the United States needs, right? Saying that all of these things would have defaulted towards the government rather than to Trump. They say the appointment of the special master would be inconsistent with the equitable principles and the case did not involve complex records, so the privilege team was appropriate. Right? These are the arguments from the government. As to injunctive relief, whether they could continue to prosecute Trump, the United States said that Trump waited too long. Right, He sort of waived his opportunity to stop them from prosecuting him. 
He was delaying the the objection and it was delaying the investigation, which is causing harm to the government. Trump responded and he said, of course, we've got Fourth Amendment standing. We can be here. I've got some documents in there that I, we know are mine. I've got possessory interest over those. And you took them anyways. They say, while Trump appears to view appointment of a special master as a predicate. Oh, my goodness. What happened there? What happened? Hang on. Let me refresh this. I don't know what just happened. My PDF just died. All right. Plaintiff Trump says that he had Fourth Amendment standing because the characterization of the documents, whether personal or presidential, went to the merits of his claim, not his standing to raise it. They write, Trump views the appointment of the special master as, as a predicate. And you can see we're getting into some rules reading. They say the district court granted the plaint Trump's motion in part, and we've covered that. They go through the Ritchie factors. And let's read some of this analysis. They say, for one factor, they say callous disregard for Trump's constitutional rights. The district court found no evidence that the United States has engaged in this type of behavior. As to the second factor, Trump's interest in and need for the property, the district court determined that plaintiff had an interest in at least some documents like his medical documents, but it made no finding that he had a need for the classified documents. So you see what they're doing? They're, they're sort of categorizing these separately. Trump said, the special master should be involved because I have at least a possessory interest in, let's say, my passport that you took, right? Or some other documents like his will or something. And that privilege, that possessory interest in, that, in those pieces of property gives him enough to expand the hula hoop to cover the entire batch of documents. But the Court of Appeals is separating those out. They're saying, well, all right, I mean, it gives you some standing over maybe those other documents, but maybe not the classified documents, unless you can show that there's sort of a nexus there. Is there a connection between the two? The third factor, they say Judge Eileen Cannon weighed in favor of jurisdiction because Trump suffered a likelihood of harm and that the district court concluded that it could retain jurisdiction. Now, we get to this and it looks like we get some on the merits, the court writes, the district court deemed a special master was warranted and they're explaining sort of what the district court did. So we're going to fast forward through some of this procedural history and let's get down into some discussion. The court says, when deciding whether to grant a stay pending appeal, we look at four factors. We've covered those. It's sort of irreparable harm, likelihood of success on the merits and other things. So one factor they say the United States argues that the district court probably made a mistake when it took jurisdiction over this and stopped the government from prosecuting Trump. And they say, we agree with that. They did over, the, Judge Eileen Cannon did overextend the jurisdiction. They say, well, look, we've got precedent on this. Our binding precedent states that when a person seeks return of seized property, those actions are governed by equitable principles. And here, while Trump disclaimed that the motion was for a return of property as specified under Rule 41, he ascertained or asserted that equitable jurisdiction existed. The 11th Circuit writes, they say, a big question is whether a court should exercise its equitable jurisdiction over a case, right? And this is whether a court should grant or not grant injunctions, whether the court should have stopped the government from prosecuting Trump or not. We don't know. But the court now says we begin, as the district court did, with callous disregard, which is the foremost consideration, they say, that applies. So this is the most important factor in determining whether the court should exercise its equitable jurisdiction, whether it has the power to stop the prosecution or to continue the prosecution or, or either way. The 11th Circuit says here, in this case, the district court concluded that Trump did not show that the United States acted in callous disregard of his constitutional rights, right? In other words, the government was not, it didn't reach that high standard of callous disregard, which is what, what seems to be like a high, a pretty high standard. They say no party can test that the district court finding in this regard, the absence of indispensable factors of that, that egregious disregard is just not something that exists here. They say... For our part, we cannot discern why Trump 
would have an individual interest in or a need for any one of the 100 documents with the classification markings. They write classified documents are marked to show that they are classified. For instance, with their classification level. They are owned, produced by the government. We've seen that, that statute referenced many times. They say, for this reason, a person may have access to classified information only if he has a need to know basis for the information. They say Trump has not even attempted to show that he has a need to know the information contained in the documents. Right? And we talked about that as sort of burden shifting. Right? Why does he have to show that if the government is seizing them from him? Well, why does he have to show it? Well, remember, we talked yesterday about the different standards that exist between the civil prosecution of a, of a complaint versus the criminal prosecution of a crime, right? Two totally different standards. On one standard, we have what's called the presumption of, of, of innocence plus the burden of proof relying with the government, meaning beyond a reasonable doubt. On the other side, for a civil case, it's much lower than that. It's just preponderance of the evidence, right? That's the standard. And they say Trump hasn't shown any one of those standards at all. But the question, of course, is, does that burden apply to Trump? Why would that burden apply to him and not to the other side? In this case, because it's civil, it's because he was the moving party, right? He filed the request for the special master. So Judge Raymond Deary said that the burden really relied with him. The 11th Circuit says, nor has Trump established that the current administration has waived that requirement for these documents, which, of course, they're not. They want Trump prosecuted. But even if Trump had, they say, in and of itself, that would not explain why Trump has an individual interest in the classified documents. The 11th Circuit says that Trump suggests that he may have declassified these documents when he was president, right? There's the may again. But the record, says the 11th Circuit, contains no evidence that any of those records were declassified. And before the special master, Trump resisted providing any evidence that he had declassified any of these documents. And there's take a look at a letter from James Trustee that we haven't seen, but apparently James Trustee is saying that uh, we're not giving you those documents. In any event, at least for these purposes, the declassification argument, they say, is a red herring because declassifying an official document would not change its content or render it personal. So even if we assume that Trump did declassify some of the documents, that would not explain why he has a personal interest in them. This factor, they say, Trump's personal interest, or the lack thereof, weighs against exercising jurisdiction. So you see what this is, it is Trump hasn't said anything about these documents or shown any connection or any relationship to these documents in any way. And so how can that be something that he has an interest in or has a, a, a say over if he doesn't have any interest in them? They ask whether Trump would be irreparably injured if this prosecution were to continue. And they say that enough, that by itself is not enough. They write, we cannot conclude that Trump would be irreparably harmed and permitting the United States to retain the documents does not suggest that they will be released. So they talk about the remaining personal injury that exists. And they say, in sum, this final factor weighs, again, against the lower district court having jurisdiction. In sum, the 11th Circuit says none of the Ritchie factors favor in exercising equitable jurisdiction over this case. It was saying that Judge Eileen Cannon should not have been able to do what she did. And so consequently... They say the United States is substantially likely to succeed in showing the district court abused its discretion in exercising the jurisdiction over the motion. Now, they talk about the remainder of this uh, being a, a sort of a, a different factor, but we'll fast forward through this and let's see what they say here at the conclusion. They say the public interest favors a stay and another factor. And for the reasons we've explained, we grant the stay pending appeal. The district court is stayed, so Judge Eileen Cannon is stayed to the extent that it enjoins the government's use of the classified documents and requires the government to give those documents over to the special master. End of the ruling from the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals, and that means that Trump loses, or so the standard thinking goes. Remember, if Trump were to communicate about the status of his position on the classified documents, that might actually expose him to more criminal liability because it might show that he's got indicia, he's got intent, he's got the mens rea of knowing he had the documents and he intentionally declassified them. So I talked about this on our walk and talk this morning. I'm not so sure that this is a, a gigantic loss for Trump. And if they do not appeal it, I think that that is the right call. If they don't appeal it, 
that means that this is a win for them. If they do appeal it, that means they, they want the special master to get the documents. And I haven't seen anything on appeals yet. But that's the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, the mind map is going to be in white today because for some reason the uh, thing is not working. But the next thing we want to look at is Judge Eileen Cannon's response. Judge Eileen Cannon is the district court judge who just had the ruling come back against her, so not in her favor. Judge Eileen Cannon wrote this after the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals came out. Let's get our red pen handy. This is the order following the partial stay. The 11th Circuit granted the stay, the request from the prosecutors, to stop the special master from getting those 100 documents. In a two-page order, Judge Eileen Cannon is responding. She says, all right, everybody, we just got heard at the 11th Circuit, and they ruled against us, so I guess I better tell you what's going on. Cannon says, this cause comes before the court following the 11th Circuit order, granting the government's motion for a partial stay. The 11th Circuit order stays this court's order to the extent that it enjoins the government from use of the 100 documents bearing the classification markings and that it requires the government to submit those documents over to the special master. So Judge Eileen Cannon says, all right, the manager showed up and in accordance with the 11th Circuit's order, it is hereby ordered and adjudged as follows. The term seized material in the court's order appointing the special master is modified, and it's going to include all material seized on August 8th, except the approximately 100 documents bearing the classification markings, meaning that the special master is going to get everything, all of those 11,000 plus documents, minus those 100 documents, right? The government does not want the, this special master to see those things which is like, what's the point of the special master then, right? Isn't that what we're talking about, these confidential documents? Isn't that what we want the referee for? The Judge Cannon says, paragraph 5B1 sub B2 is stricken from the record. And also paragraph six of the special master order is hereby stricken, done in orders in chambers by Judge Eileen Cannon. So just modifying that official order and it is, now going to be the special master's obligation, their duty to sort of perform their obligations under the order with these deletions. And those deletions, of course, are about the furthering criminal prosecution and about the 100 documents that the special master was going to get their hands on, but is now not going to see. And Trump's team loses the appeal, but we don't know if this is an actual loss for their criminal defense. That remains to be seen. And we will, of course, continue to cover that. We also have another document here. Now that the 11th Circuit has issued their order and the special master, Raymond J. Deary, is not going to be looking at those 100 documents, the special master authored a case management plan. And he says, okay, well, we've got some new business to attend to. And in light of these new changes, I'm going to communicate to Trump's lawyers and to the government prosecutors. This is what I want to see happen as it relates to what we can take a look at in this case. It's a seven page document, Trump versus the United States of America. Raymond J. Deary, the special master is authoring this order. He says, pursuant to the order appointing the special master and the order following a stay that just came out from Judge Eileen Cannon, special master hereby directs the parties to do the following. And Deary says, nothing expressed in this management plan relieves either party of any obligation imposed by the court in either order. So the judge is saying, I'm giving you my special master orders, but don't you think that you're escaping anything that you have to do from Judge Cannon? Number one, Special Master Raymond Deary says, no later than September 26, which is coming up here pretty soon, a government official with sufficient knowledge of the matter shall submit a declaration or an affidavit as to whether the detailed property inventory represents a full and accurate extent of the property that was seized from Trump's residence at Mar-a-Lago. And no later than September 30th, Trump shall submit a declaration or an affidavit that includes each of the following factual matters. So Trump's got some homework and the government has some homework. The government's homework is to make sure that what they say they took is actually what they took and make sure that the list matches reality. Trump has some homework. Let's see what it is. His lawyers have to assemble a list of any specific items set forth in the detailed property inventory that Trump says were not seized from the premises. 
So if the FBI says, okay, we took this, this, and this, Trump says, no, you didn't, you didn't take that. Also, a list of any specific items that are in the property inventory that were seized, but as to which plaintiff says the description or the contents was incorrect. So Trump can say, okay, yeah, they did take that, but they didn't find Melania's underwear in Melania's closet. They found it in the laundry room, right, or whatever. They could say, we disagree. It wasn't there or it wasn't actually that. That description doesn't match. C. Trump and his team, they have to come up with a detailed list and a description of any item that Trump says was seized from the residence, but was not listed in the detailed property report. So we've got sort of three categories there. Stuff that was seized, but not listed. Stuff that was not seized, but listed. And then stuff that was listed and seized, but was found in an incorrect location or the, the description doesn't match. Judge Deary says, the special master, he says, this submission shall be Trump's final opportunity to raise any factual dispute as to the completeness and the accuracy of the detailed property inventory, right? That's it. So Trump, this is it. You're going to get a spreadsheet of all this stuff and you better determine, oh my gosh, the whole computer just crashed. The whole computer didn't just crash, but my driver just crashed. All right, here it is. It says, no later than October 14th, the government shall submit a declaration or an affidavit from a person with sufficient knowledge of the matter responding to any factual disputes as to the completeness or the accuracy of the property inventory. So the government now, right? Trump, you got a final order, final request. Government, now it's your turn. No later than October 14th, you've also got to submit a declaration from a person with sufficient knowledge responding to any of those factual disputes that Donald Trump raised. Upon reviewing the party's submissions, the undersigned will further schedule proceedings needed to resolve any of these disputes, if necessary, also an evidentiary hearing at which witnesses with knowledge will provide testimony. Okay, so if there are disputes about this, then we may get some pretty explosive hearings, right? The government may be able to subpoena some people. Trump's defense uh, may be able to subpoena some people. And we'll actually have some legitimate, serious evidentiary hearings. To the extent that the revolution, re resolution of any factual disputes identifies additional materials that should be reviewed, the undersigned will set further proceedings as needed. The identification and resolution of any factual disputes as to the completeness and accuracy will proceed concurrently with the substantive proceedings detailed below. All right. So how, are, how is this going to work mechanically? We've got some deadlines, a review of the seized materials. The following deadlines and procedures shall govern the parties and the special master's review of the materials. No later than 923, the parties shall agree upon and contract with a document review vendor who's going to see, who's going to review the seized materials and put them in electronic form. September 26, the government's going to make available all copies of the special master in electronic format and give them Bates numbers. So just basically put them into evidence is basically what this says. The government shall also provide an electronic spreadsheet that correlates the numbers and make sure the privilege review team has properly analyzed everything. Trump shall provide the special master and the government with an annotated copy of a spreadsheet described above that specifies for each document, whether Trump asserts any of the following. Oh, so this, this spreadsheet is going to have to be really juicy. Annotated copy. Do any of these documents have attorney client privilege? Do any of these documents have work product privilege? How about executive privilege that prohibits review of the document within the executive branch? And we talked about this previously. We had our different buckets, our different categories of issues, right? That, that different categories that could be used differently. And this has many other additional categories. The executive privilege that prohibits the dissemination of documents. The document is a presidential record and the document is a personal record, right? So we had several buckets, but this is even more robust than what we had. They say Trump's designations shall be on a document by document basis. So he has to go through that spreadsheet and each row, he's got to file them into one of these categories. Say, yep, that was attorney-client privilege. This was executively privileged and so on. For any document that Trump designates as privileged or personal, Trump shall include a brief statement explaining the basis for the designation. 
Trump shall also provide his des designations to the government on a rolling basis for each set that Trump provides to the government. The parties are to confer and attempt to resolve any of these disputes. No later than seven calendar days after each service, the party shall submit to the special master a log. The log shall have each party's position on the dispute. They say special master understands that the government has already provided Trump with an initial set of documents for review. Trump is set to directed to review and prioritize those lists. They say Trump shall serve the government with, to, with its final and complete log of designations. And here's a summary of the due dates. So Trump serves their designations on these dates, 926, 930, 1007, 1014. And then they submit logs after the fact. So it's sort of a back and forth. We send you a spreadsheet, you send us a spreadsheet. And then anything that we disagree about goes up to the special master for conversations. It says that once the court has reviewed the special master's recommendations and ruled on any objections, then the special master and the court will consider Trump's request for a return of property. We know that Trump is paying for this. And so let's see what the bill is going to look like. The undersigned has determined that this requires Honorable James Ornstein for help. And it requires also Judge Ornstein. Yeah, Judge Ornstein is going to help uh, resolve all of this. The court also needs staff. And so the staff is going to be, you know, billing for this. The parties may submit comments on the staffing and compensation plan, but the case management plan shall be filed on the public docket. Of course it is. And we are reading it right now. The next status conference for this matter scheduled October 6, 2022 at 2 PM. So that was the order signed by Raymond Deary that is laying out the plan. And it's going to be very interesting to see because Trump has sort of a big ob obligation there. Trump has to communicate about the position that he has as to each one of those different documents. And so we are going to, of course, continue to cover all of that and more. But let's take a look now at some of the response that was out there. We are pulling up our mind map here. And let's see what else we've got. So Donald Trump was, was on Sean Hannity's show and he was being interviewed. Let me pause here for a quick minute and make sure that we are still live. And get the chats back open again. Because Trump was on the Sean Hannity show and he had some interesting things to say. Donald Trump shows up onto Sean Hannity's show talking about Mar-a-Lago, and he explains in detail what the process was. So let me ask you this question, because I, I think this is the next logical question, because the president of the United States, you, unlike, say, Hillary Clinton in her case, right. a president has the power to declassify. Correct. Okay. You had said on Truth Social a number of times you did de declassify. I did declassify, yes. Okay. Is there a process? What was your process to declassify? There doesn't have to be a process, as right. I understand it. You know, there's different people say different right. things, but as I understand, there doesn't have to be. If you're the president of the United States, you can declassify just by saying um, it's declassified, even by thinking about it, because you're sending it to Mar-a-Lago or to wherever you're sending it. And now he's getting skewered over this comment, but what he's sort of implying is that by ordering or by taking action, by, by, by doing something, by demonstrating something, you have obviously made that decision. It's like if you take a box, if you say, okay, I, this is a box of classified documents, and I take that box of classified documents out, right? You're sort of saying, I'm declassifying that document. It's like it, your action is demonstrating the thing, right? It's sort of what he's getting at. Now, the left, of course, is skewering him over that. Oh, he, what, he just think it? Like he just tel telepathically transmitted this to somebody else and everybody should just read his mind? That's not what he's saying, right? He's saying it's like, if you took, if you take the trash out to the trash can, then you took the trash out to the trash can. You didn't have to say it. You didn't have to order anybody to do it. You didn't have to communicate or fill out a form. You just kind of did it, right? And there, there are things like that that happen in law and in business. And what he's saying is sort of that, right? My, my action 
is demonstrating that there was a declassification process that occurred and it doesn't need to be this big convoluted thing where we're filling out a bunch of forms. So here he is continuing on with Sean. It doesn't have to be a process. There can be a process, but there doesn't have to be. You're the president, you make that decision. So when you send it, it's declassified. We, I declassified everything. Now I declassified things and we were having a lot of problems with NARA. You know, NARA, uh, is a radical left group of people running that thing. And when you send documents over there, I would say there's a very good chance that a lot of those documents will never be seen again. Wow. There's also a lot of speculation because of what they did, the severity of the FBI coming and raiding Mar-a-Lago. Were they looking for the Hillary Clinton emails that were oh. deleted, but they are around someplace? Were they looking for the well, wait, spying on Trump? you had it. Do, do... No, no, they may be saying... They may have thought that it was that in did. there. Okay. And a lot of people said the only thing that would give the kind of severity that they showed by actually coming in and raiding with many, many people is the Hillary Clinton deal, the Russia, Russia, Russia stuff, or, I mean, there are, there are a number of things, the spying on Trump's campaign. So they spied on my campaign. Spied on my campaign, says Trump, and that was responsible for a whole litany of issues that he had to deal with, right? Including the Carter Page investigation, multiple different impeachments. And he's saying, you know, maybe the FBI that has a history of being highly problematic in my administration, both prior to him even becoming president, while he was president and after he was president, all sorts of incredible problems with them. And so to, basically he's, he's explaining that this is an overdue library book prosecution that wouldn't have happened to any other president. And it's happening because it's Donald Trump. I think there's a lot of truth to that. Trump also was telling this fun story when he was talking with Hannity and Trump, Trump breaks the news that when the FBI was raiding his residence at Mar-a-Lago, they took his will. He thinks in addition to Melania's and Barron's and other stuff that they were rummaging around through in the Mar-a-Lago residence, his will? Part two of this question is this. They took your passport, they took your medical records, they took your tax records, and probably the scariest part to me, and this is why a broad warrant like this to me would be dangerous, we do have a Fourth Amendment. Um, they also took, what, 500 pages of attorney-client privilege information? Did you, have you gotten that back, by the way? A lot, I don't know, I really don't know. They took yeah. a lot. I think they took my will. Whoa. I found out yesterday. I said, where is it? Uh, am I in it? I think they took my will. <laughs> am I in it? It could cause a lot of no problems. <laughs> no. That could cause a lot of people, uh, a lot of problems if that gets published from uh, people that won't be so happy or maybe will be very happy. <laughs> okay. But no, I think they took my will. No, it's a horrible thing. Took his will. Sean Hannity says, am I in it? Could I be in it? Does Sean want to be in it? I don't think that anybody who's going to be in that will is going to be uh, going to be looked at favorably under the FBI. Maybe that's why they want it. So they can go take all the money away from every, they should send it over to Letitia James and see what she does with it. So, uh, that's Donald Trump responding to the raid at Mar-a-Lago. And of course the 11th circuit handing out what many people say is not a good ruling, but we'll have to see if Trump doesn't appeal it to the Supreme court. I think that means that his criminal defense lawyers are saying, maybe it's better that we don't actually have a special master who is uh, overlooking all of these things because they would require you to take a hard line on documents that we don't want you to take a hard line on. So we'll continue to follow. Thank you for subscribing and liking this video while you're watching out there. 